So, just to play with the idea, gonna make a project. Today is day I. So what do I want to be able to do? I want to create an array, and then I want to start putting numbers in it, but I want to skip numbers that, you know, are already in the array. So let's make our two-dimensional array. Int square, square. I'm just going to call it AR for array. Equals new int 10 end square, beginning square, 10 end square. All right. And we know we're going to need the ability to print it out occasionally. So why not create ourselves a method that will dump the array to the screen? It has to be a static method since we're in the same class as our driver main. Main method, excuse me, static methods can only call static methods if they're in the same class. Doesn't need to return anything though. We're just going to print. But we're going to take a two-dimensional array as our parameter. So int, two pairs of angle braces, A, or AR, or whatever you want to call it. The name obviously does not have to match that. And then we may as well use nested loops to print it out. So I'm just going to use two for loops, four parentheses, int, R equals zero. R is less than the length of the array. R dot length returns the number of rows in that array. So R less than AR dot length, semicolon R plus plus curly. Same thing, except we're going to go out to that length of that particular line now. So for int C equals zero, C is less than AR subscript R in subscript dot length. I want the row, the length of that particular row, semicolon, R plus plus. So let's print it out. System dot out dot printf. I'm going to use printf so I can force it to be like three characters, three spaces wide exactly. So quote percent 3D. Please give me three spaces to hold this number. End quote, comma, and then the value of our array at that position, AR, subscript R, in subscript, subscript C, in subscript. Now adding a few little comments. This is the end of that for loop. This is the end of that for loop. And this is the end of the function. If I don't put an extra print line here, down here, then it will just print all the, the numbers off the edge of the screen. So, system dot out dot print line here. Just compiling it to make sure I don't have any syntax errors. All right, so here I have declared the array. I'm going to go ahead and call our print function on it. Print parentheses AR in parentheses. The next function we write is going to be somewhat of a copy and paste job of this print loop. Why? Because to search the array, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to go into a three, you know, a, a nested loop searching, iterating through the array. All right, I've got a problem here, and, and even though I said I was going to make it static, I forgot to, and that's why I'm getting an error message. Non-static member cannot be referenced from a static context. Non-static member being the name of our function. We're in a static context, so I have to make this one static as well. Index out of bounds. I wonder what I did wrong. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I am flabbergasted. Oh, anybody see a problem? Here's one for loop, it, it increments R. Here's another for loop, it increments C. That needs to be C++ because we're incrementing the column there. So uh, if you were copying along exactly with me, if you were bothering to, then make sure you get that to be C++ rather than R++. All right, and it printed out our array or 10 by 10 array. We can repurpose this kind of loop as a search and it'll return true if it finds it and false if it does not. So we're going to copy this but instead of printing it out we're going to do an if statement and if it matches our target value, our search value, we're going to return. And then if it gets all the way through all the loops without having found it, we're going to return a false. I was talking about copying and pasting, but then I was going to be making edits and slicing and dicing, and so it might just be easier to rewrite it. So public static boolean, we want it to return true if it found it, false if not. Search, parentheses, and we need an array to search, so I'm just going to Take, you know, that int square square AR there, int square square AR comma, and then a integer to search for, int target, what we're looking for, what we're going to match. Now this one I'm not going to even put any curly braces in it, so it's going to look kind of dumb. For parentheses int r equals zero, I could, I could just copy that statement up there. R less than ar dot length, semicolon r plus plus, on the next line. For parentheses int c equals zero, c is less than ar subscript r dot length, c plus plus, not going to do it, didn't mess it up this time. If parentheses, and I'll slow down just a second as soon as I get this last thing typed, if AR at position R, so AR subscript R subscript C subscript equals equals target, in parentheses, return true, semicolon. And then down here in front of the last, you know, the closing brace for this function, I'm just going to add a return false. To get a little bit more code to fit on the screen, I would be tempted to uh, move that curly brace there, and you know, I'll move that curly brace there and there and stuff like that. Whenever I go back and I start moving the curly braces around, it starts messing people up. So here's my uh, cheap way of kind of simulating that. You don't need to do this because you're not trying to squeeze as much code on the page as I am. All right. Did it help to get it all on one screen? Not quite. So anyways, we're going to call a function to see if there's something in it. Well, the, right now there's no data in it, right? But at least compile it. Make sure it compiles. Good. Now I'm going to try to search that array for a zero, right? So back down here. If, parentheses, Search, parentheses, AR comma zero, in parentheses, equals equals true, which is not necessary, right? Whenever you're checking for a Boolean variable, you never have to compare it to true. I could delete the equal equal true, and it would work just fine. System dot out dot print line, we found a zero, end quote, parentheses, semicolon, else system dot out dot print line parentheses quote could not find a zero now when I run it I better see that it found a zero and it did if obviously right there's a million of them but if I change that to look for a one 
would not find it. Could not find it. Now it's printing out the wrong value, but that's because I've you know hard coded these values. Maybe I'll just change that to we found it and could not find it. We're not telling them what we're looking for, but all right. Anyways, do you kind of see how you would use that function now? As you were adding things to the array, you would pick a number, you would search the array to see if that number exists, and if it returned false, then go ahead and add it into the array, otherwise get another number. Does that kind of make sense? What if it's like <clears throat> the random numbers then? Like well, they would be random numbers, right. So, but I mean, like, the, like if I did Yeah, yeah. So let's make a random number. I wanted to, to cover this as well. Because the math.random function works, but it generates a number between 0 and 1, which you then have to, you know, modify and bang on to get it to work. So let's add some random numbers to this using this idea that we're going to search the array. And so here's what our pseudocode is going to look like. You know, maybe we'll just, we're going to need a random number generator. Random rnd equals new random, parentheses in parentheses, semicolon. And let's maybe add five random numbers to it. So I'm going to write a little for loop for int x equals zero, s less than five, x x equals 0, semicolon, x less than 5, semicolon, x plus plus. Now let's get a random number. But this is going to be part of a while loop. So, int num is equal to rnd dot next int. And I don't know how large I want my numbers to be up to 10 maybe. That's a really bad idea. We have way more than 10 spaces in it, so I'm going to make them random numbers up to 100. Now let's check to see if that's in there. While search parentheses ar comma num is equal equal to true, while that number exists in the array, we need a new number. So get a new one. Num is equal to rnd dot next int parentheses 100 in parentheses. Now my I'm winding up with too many closing curly braces. It's going to be definitely time to wander around in just a second. But at this point, we have finally found one. When search does not return a true, it's because it's not in the array. Great. Well, let's put it in there. I guess I should have done a, a, um, another one of those, you know, for r equals zero, and, you know, whatever. So I apologize, but I'm going to wind up modifying this for statement. For parentheses int r equals zero, r is less than ar dot length r plus plus. I really wish I'd gotten this right because I'm going to be making, I'll do some big tabbing here. And then for int c equals 0, c is less than ar dot ar subscript r in subscript dot length c plus plus. Now I need to spend a little bit of time cleaning up my tabs. And at the point we get here, we finally have a good number. It's not in the array. So let's set it. AR subscript R in subscript. Subscript C in subscript equals that number. And then two closing curly braces. And we may have way too many closing braces after that. Yep, yep, I definitely had too many. I'm going to add some comments that this is the end of the class. This is the end of main. And right before the end of main, I want to print my array out again. Print parentheses AR in parentheses. We 
seem to be in an infinite loop. This thing must be always returning true. I did not plan on this going wrong. Let me uh, make some changes without you following along. Well, we're going to have to abort this little exercise. Well, I see it counting up. Three, nine, four, five, five. Is it not giving it enough time to finish? Seven, eight, eight, eight. It's taking a, it's finding it very difficult to fill all the numbers in. Why? Because I made a 10 by 10 array and I said fill it with exactly numbers, you know, between. It's getting stuck at the end. We don't have a broad enough range of numbers. So out of all the changes that I made, you don't need to make any of them except. Let's change this to a much larger number, like 999. 999. We're going to pick numbers, or 1,000, or something like that. We're going to have to change our print statement to support such large numbers, but this, would, this, this will work. All right. Like I said, my output looks lousy. To fix my output, I need to go back to my print array command and change that from, like, 3D to maybe 5D. Something like that. All right, and so there we go. Does that make sense, what we're doing? We created a method to search the array, and if it found it, it returns a true, and we're looping on that function, that search function, until we get a number that's not part of the array. And so now we have a unique, an array where every element is unique. Yes, sir. One line of code missing. That one right there. Right.
sitting there, and um, I can print out the code, or you can look at the notes, and we'll get it working. So I want to talk about stacks. I want to talk about queues. We kind of have. But we're going to emulate a stack. We're going to make a class that emulates a stack. We're going to use an array list. To emulate the stack, what are we going to do? Every time we do a push, we're going to add something to the array list, maybe to the beginning of the array list. And then every time we do a pop, we're going to pull something off the array list from the same side. Again, maybe the beginning. The reason I'm taking the beginning is it's just really easy to figure out how to insert into the beginning of an array list. You just add it at index location zero, and it's real easy to delete something from it. You just delete it at index zero. I don't have to worry about the length of it. So effectively, we're going to have an array list of varying lengths. Each time we add, you know, I add Bob. And then later on, I add something else. Bob's going to be pushed down. No. So I just added Abe. I'm going to add something else, right? And all both of those are going to get pushed down. You know, and so we're going to have Sam there. And then when we're time to pop something off, we're going to return that one, and we're going to remove it from the array list. We're going to delete that element. And then when we pop again, it's going to delete that element. Return it and delete it. And then when we pop that one, it's going to delete it and return it. So we're not going to use a stack class at this point. We're going to make our own stack class. Then we'll look at uh, then we'll look at Java's stack class. So I'm going to try to be a good boy this time and actually create a separate file for my class. I'm not sure why I'm feeling so dedicated. Let's go and do that. Find where your lecture file is and in the same folder, file. New Java class. Just call it M stack for my stack, something like that. This is going to be our data class, and it has exactly one piece of, of data in it. We could put more, like the number of items and stuff like that, but we can always just ask the stack how many items there are in it. We get a good do good data encapsulation, make our data private. So private array list angle, and what's this going to be a stack of? A stack of strings, a stack of, yeah, why not strings? Array list string, end angle, and we have to give it a, a name. I'm going to call it data. It's the data for our stack. So private array list, that's a capital L angle string data equals new array list capital L angle angle parentheses parentheses and of course it does not know what an array list is so we're going to add an import for it you know our programs would be a lot easier to write if every time we created a Java file it added the import java.util.star up at the top of the program, then half of everything we ever needed would be there already. All right, and we want a push method. What the push method is going to do is it's going to insert, it's going to add, it's going to use the array list method add into the first position, pushing everything down one. And so we're going to use dot add in order to do that. So let's give this a good name, public. It's not static because it's a instance member. It needs to work on an instance of the class, so it's not a class method, so we're not going to use the word static. Public, does it need to return anything? No, it's just going to stick it on the stack. So public void push, and it needs to take a value. Well, I think that our value ought to be a, a string, since that's what our thing is, string s. So public void push parentheses string s in the parentheses. How do we add to a stack? Data dot add, and then you put the index that you want this value to be at. In this case, it's zero. We want it at the beginning of the array list, and then the data that you want to add. And if you leave off this index number, it puts it at the end of the list. Which would be a fine way to do it, but then when we're going to pop it off the list, we have to go and calculate the, the uh, length of the list and use that as our index or whatever, and I like doing it this way better.
let's also write a function that will tell us if the list is empty or not. How do we know it's empty? Well, if the size of it is zero, it is empty. So, public boolean is empty. I'm making it with a capital E because I think that mir mirrors the name. Like that. Parentheses, close parentheses. Curly brace. If, parentheses, data dot size equals equals zero, in parentheses, return true, return false. And size is a method, and I forgot to put the parentheses around the, uh, after it. I forgot to make it a function call, so I left that off. Does somebody tell me a far cleaner way of returning true or false based on that condition? I could do it in one statement. It's okay if nobody knows. Here's what it would have looked like. Return parentheses, or we wouldn't even need parentheses. Data dot, yeah, we would. Return parentheses, data dot size in parentheses equals equals zero. That would do the check, and if that was true, it would return a true. If it was not true, it would return a false. So we could have done it like that. Two more methods I think would be cool. One would be a, a print, which would print out the entire stack, just so we could sneak a peek at what its data looked like. And then we're going to need the pop. The pop is the one that returns the first element of the list after having removed it. So, public string pop. Why, is, why am I returning a string? Because that's what the data is, and when we pull it off, we need to return it. If it was an array of, of doubles, we would need to return a double. Public string pop, parentheses, close parentheses, angle. Firstly, we'd better find out. We'd better make sure now nah, we're not going to do a darn bit of safety checking. It's going to crash if we call pop too many times. So, let's get the value. String s equals data dot get subscript zero. Please give me the position at that index. Now we need to remove that value. So data dot remove and you could either remove it by index or you could remove it by its value so I could put either an s there and say I want you to delete the first element that matches that piece of data or I just want you to remove element zero I think that's a that's a better way of doing it and then return s that's our stat class it's a functioning it's a completely functioning stat class at this point ran it to make sure that I didn't have any syntax errors. Before we boldly go forth, I'd like to, to y'all to do the same. My class was mstack. When I named it, I gave it a capital M and no other capital letters. However you named it, you're going to need to remember that. Go back to your code that you were just editing, the main code. You could put it up at the top of main or at the bottom. Why not down at the bottom of main? Go down here. Let's create a stack. M stack, what am I going to call it? Mine equals new M stack parentheses in parentheses. If we were awesome, we would have written our stack in such a way that we could use this syntax. I want a stack of doubles. It's called templates. We don't know how to do that yet, so I'm going to leave it like this. Now I'm going to add a couple numbers to the stack. Oh, I forgot to add a print function to it. Well, all right, so mine.push 
3, and I'm just going to copy and paste that a couple times, sticking in new numbers. Except it's supposed to be a string, sorry, okay, so string, Bob, in quote. I'm going to add a couple more names, Ted, Fred, and then I'm going to pop those things out. String S, S equals mine dot pop, parentheses in, parentheses, and let's print S out. System dot out dot print line, print line, parentheses, quote, popped, space, end quote, plus S. So the way stacks work, they are last in, first out. The last thing pushed on the stack is the thing that's on the top, so it's going to be the first thing that comes out. The first thing that's going to come out of our stack is Fred. So that's what we're going to see when we print it. And if I do that a couple more times, right, I could copy and paste that. What is this one going to print? I think I heard it. Please repeat. I'm sure you got it right. I just didn't hear. Oh, come on. You just said it. Ted. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Going to print out Ted because last on was that, and then the second to last was that, and then the third to last. Last in, first out. And so we got Fred, we got Ted. And then if we kept popping, eventually we would get a runtime error. A syntax, uh, excuse me, an exception would be generated. We can prove that, right. I'm just going to copy those two statements and paste them yet again, two times in a row. And since we pushed three things into it and popped four things out of it, it's not going to work. worked up to a point. So what should we be doing? We should be using that if empty and making it if not empty. Right. Checking before we popped. I'm going to comment this code out and instead write a loop. Or maybe I'll just delete that last one, right? That's the one that messed us up. I'm going to delete that last pair and then I'm going to push a couple more things onto it. Mind up push parentheses quote Luke end quote semicolon. Let's just push a few more things onto it. Ben R two D two and Han. All right, so now I have four things on there, and now I've decided I want to get all of them out for whatever purposes. So I'm going to write a loop that'll do that. While mine.isEmpty is equal to false, keep popping data. While mine.isEmpty, parentheses, in parentheses, equals equals false, just do what we did. S equals mine.pop parentheses in, parentheses, and then print it out. System dot out dot print s plus double quote, space double quote. And then after the while loop, I'm going to do a print line. System dot out dot print line. And so our output's going to be Han, R2D2, Ben, and Luke since that's last in first back. All right, and so it was. Why do we care? What, what is a stack? Why would anybody in the world want a stack? You would not want to implement a printer queue with a stack. If I was printing my, my thesis, 
and then somebody else wanted to print their thing, and somebody else wanted to print their thing, it'd be really annoying if the last person to submit their job got it, their data first, right? It should be first come, first serve. That's a queue. That's not a stack. It would take maybe one line changed to, to turn this class, this simulation of a stack, into a simulation of a queue. Kind of may ask y'all to do that as a, as a little extra credit thingy, because it really would be only one line of change uh, to change. Turn our fake stack class into a fake queue class. You would need to name push and pop, though, off into other names um, that more represented a queue. Some, uh, some representations call them Q or NQ, ENQ, and then DQ, DE. So if you want to exercise your stack, I'm just going to print this part of the code out. printer is. Yeah, there we go. So Java comes with a stack class. Well, why did we make our own? Because I wanted you to have the idea of the pushing and the popping and how we implemented it. Let's see if we can get the Java stack class going. Let's see what examples I have before we...
that does not look like what it was advertised. I wonder how many years this file has been copied from class to class showing us how to draw a triangle with the turtle class in Python. So the homework that we're working for is this. We're going to write a program that uses a stack to accept entry of integers from the user. Or you can make a read from a file if you so chose. We haven't been doing any file reading this semester, so why don't we just accept user input, scan out. And here's what the program's going to do. It's going to keep looping. Give me a number. All right. If the number is zero, it's going to do something special, so we're not going to do that. Give me a number. Negative one, well, that's when it quits. All right, so if the number is even, it pushes it onto the stack. So I just typed in the number five, no, six, because that's even, and it pushes it on the stack. And then it loops again, give me another number. And so I typed in another six. Okay, now we have two sixes on the stack. Loop again, give me a number. I'm gonna type in an odd. If the number is odd, pop a value off the stack. Multiply it by the number just entered, so 6 times 5, and then display that, so it would print out 30. And now we only have one thing on our stack. So it loops again. Now I'm going to type in another odd number. Say I give it a 3. All right, it's an odd number, so pop a value off the stack. Right now our stack is empty. And we had a 6 times that 3, it's going to print an 18. Run it again. I mean, it loops again. Enter another number. Well, if we typed in an odd number, there's no more data left on the stack, and it would blow up. Or you could put some code in there to handle it, right? What about these other special cases? If the number is zero, you're supposed to pop all the stack values, displaying their sum. And the stack will be empty at that point, right? So if I typed in a 2, and then I typed in a 4, and then I typed in a 6, and then I typed in a 3, well, 6 times 3 is 18, and that one's popped off. And then I typed in a 0. It would add the, all of these up, and pop them off, and print 6, because that's what those were. And now the stack is empty. And if they enter a negative 1, we quit. So we need to make sure that we know how to use the stack class in such a way that we could support this particular problem. Yeah, a stack of Qs would be a good idea. I mean, a, a stack of... Integers would be a good idea. No, here's an example, right? Push a 2, okay, 2 is on the stack. 4, 4 is on the stack. 6, 6 is on the stack. 0, it pops them all off and prints the sum. The stack is now empty. Please enter a whole number. 10, push that on the stack. 12, push that on the stack. 13, pop being 12, and then 12 times 13 is 156. 5, well, that's an odd number, so we do a pop. Popping 10, 10 times 5 is 50. Please enter a whole number, negative one, program done. So I'm going to go back to our main. And let's see if we can get Java stack class going. Stack, angle, and now I need to put a parenthetical comment in here, which I mentioned with array list, but all of these collections. All of the Java collections require class types, parentheses reference types, not primitive types. What are your primitive types? Int, float, double, things like that. So instead, rather than int, we use integer. Rather than double with a lowercase d, we use double with a capital D. Something like that. Okay. Now, all that was so that if I wanted to create a stack of integers, I would do this. Let's give it a name. How about the stack with a lowercase s? equals new stack parentheses in print no angles less than greater than parentheses in parentheses there 
It doesn't know what a stack is, of course. So add import for java.util.stack. Now, honestly, I thought I'd uh, changed it to java.util.star up in my import up at the top, but it doesn't seem to be, so I fixed my import. Now we're ready to go. We can add some data to it. Stack dot push ten. Stack dot push twelve. Right. Stack dot push fourteen. Now let's pop all those values, summing them up. So we're going to need a sum variable. We're going to need an accumulator. Int sum is equal to zero. While parentheses stack dot is empty parentheses in parentheses equals equals false. And I'm sure that uh, that half of y'all know that the more elegant way of writing that would be to do this. Put an exclamation mark at the beginning of that and taking the rest of this. And you just read that as while not stack is empty. Then let's get some data. Int value equals stack dot pop parentheses in parentheses. Let's print it. System dot out dot print line parentheses quote popping space quote plus value parentheses semicolon and add that to our sum. So sum plus equals value. So let's print out the sum. System dot out dot print line sum of pops equals space end quote plus sum. So what I'm expecting it to say is popping 14, popping 12, popping 10 because they're going into the reverse order in which they were pushed onto the list on the stack and then print the the sum of that, which is 36, according to my estimate. On the other hand, if I have a syntax error, then it's not going to work at all. It's funny, all this worked earlier. Good. Oh. In order to print this out, I did some cutting and pasting and I created a new Java file and I thought it really was part of my project. Alrighty. All right, and there we go. It popped 14, 12, and 10. Just copy those three pushes again so that we have some more data on our stack. And let's pop two values off and multiply them together, or at least pop one value off and multiply it by, you know, something. Int value one, int v1 equals stack dot pop, close parentheses in, close parentheses. Int v2 equals stack dot pop, open parentheses, close parentheses. And then int product equals v1 times v2. Now, that's not the way the homework wanted it to do. If you typed in an odd value, it was supposed to pop one value off and then multiply it by what the user just typed in. But just for examples, taking two values and multiplying them, and that'll be the last two values added to the stack, which would be 14 and 12. I didn't even print it out, but I'm sure that's the case. At this point, how long is our stack? It's only got one thing left in it. 
we can call dot size to get the length of the stack. System dot out dot print line parentheses stack size is space end quote comma stack dot size parentheses in parentheses in parentheses. And I got an error. What do you know about that? Oh, that should be a plus. Sorry, I flipped over to Python syntax there for a second. Okay. And it makes sense that the stack size is one because we pushed three things onto it and we popped two things off. So why do you use stacks? Well, they're used in computer science a lot, like when writing compilers, because you know, if you're function A and you call function B and you call function C and you call function D, now D is ready to return. D returns, we're back into C. C returns, we're back into B. B returns, we're back into A. You saw those return statements kind of work like popping things off a stack, right? All the way back. I pushed, I pushed the memory pointer for function A onto the stack and then I went to B. And I pushed a pointer to B on the stack, and I went to C. I pushed a pointer to C on the stack, and I went to D. Now I'm returning, right? So I re pop the stack and return to that last value. And then I return out of that, I pop that value. Right, so you see that uh, function calls, method calls, are chained together using a stack, a call stack. Also, just in things like an editor, right? I type in... I space love space Java and I hit undo, it undoes the last thing. And I decide I don't like Java anymore. So I type C. And then I hit undo. C is undone. But I and love are still in the stack. And so if I hit undo again, it's going to remove the word love. And only the word I is going to be left. And I hit undo. And now the stack is empty. So undo lists are also done. So I'm pretty sure we all have the idea of writing something which accepts a menu option to quit. But I think that's going to be about the last thing that I want to do here. We're going to need a scanner for that. Scanner sc equals new scanner system.in. Not system.inherited channel. Where did that come from? System.in parentheses. Add an import for that. Let's ask the user for a value and let's put it on to one of these two stacks. How about our M stack? Mine. Okay. So. While true. Just keep doing this until we get a break. While true. While parentheses true, in parentheses, curly brace. Let's ask the user for some data. I wonder if we already have an S that I've used. These single letter variable names. Okay. String input equals sc.next line. Nah, just next. We should tell the user that we want them to type in something. So above that, I'm going to put a print. System.out.print, parentheses, print, parentheses, quote. Enter a name, colon, space, end quote, in parentheses, semicolon. Now, we didn't tell them that they could type in Q to quit. Let's 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 add that. Enter a name, parentheses, or Q to quit. So we better check. And how do you compare two string? And you better not do if input equals equals Q. In this language, it doesn't work. We've talked about how you compare strings, how you compare objects. You have to use one of their methods. Input dot equals. Yeah, you have to use dot equals exactly. So if input dot 
equals parentheses quote q in parentheses in parentheses we're going to break break out of our loop otherwise we're going to add it to the stack so mine dot push parentheses in parentheses or push input into parentheses and once they are done with the stack why don't we rip through it printing everything in it kind of like we did up above while parentheses exclamation point for not while not mine dot is empty parentheses in parentheses curly brace system dot out dot print line parentheses quote popped space end quote plus mine dot pop open parent close parent close parent semicolon so Joe Bob Sam whatever and then finally I'm going to type in capital Q and it's going to print everything in reverse order sense. Your homework assignment is not going to ask for strings. It's going to ask for ints. There's going to be some in, um, if statements in here. If the number is even as opposed to if it's odd. How do you check to see if a number is even? Oh, how do you check if a number is even? Yeah. Uh, not two. Yeah. yeah, you modulus it against two. Exactly. So, I'm going to add that as a comment here down at the bottom so that we have it somewhere how to see if something is even if x percent 2 equals equals 0 if you modulus it by 2 if you divide 2 into it and there's no remainder then that means it's even how do you check to see if something's the odd, odd? just the opposite if x mod 2 greater than 0 that means it's odd just because the assignment differentiates the data based on one of those two things. Good enough. All right, we're going to have a staggering two weeks to do this because one of your weeks is going to be full, filled with going to Cancun for spring break or something. So I would like you to, to uh, attempt the uh, extra credit as well trying to turn, try to create a fake Q class. I'll post a little bit more details, the words that I want you to use for pushing data in and popping it out if it's a Q. So what is stack class bias? You know, we built our own pushes and pops, and then, then you switched over to stack. I just wanted to show it using the real stack. And I mean, the real stack class. So the real stack class supports any data type, not just strings. You, know, you can make stacks of, you know, of anything, stacks of arrays, stacks of. I don't know if I'm answering your question. That was still used. You did stack dot push. Was that using the built-in stack functions push, or was that correct, using the correct. push that we made? Now I hope that I haven't horribly confused you, because we made a class called mstack and if I'd been thinking clearly if ahead of time I would have made the methods mpush and mpop so I can mimic that now scroll up to where you create your mstack right click on push and go to refactor 
rename and call it M push refactor and then do the same thing for mine.pop highlight pop refactor rename call it M pop refactor all and so you're right the first thing we used was our M mystat class and then we flipped over to using the legit stat class and then for that last little looping example I went back and I just kept using a stack that we had created from our own class I don't have a particularly strong compelling reason to say why I did that it's just because we had two sets of data there one was holding integers and one was holding strings and I felt like letting us type in strings and add it to the stack but I did choose names that exactly mirrored the real stack class and that's why we had So now that we have renamed those methods, it looks a little bit different. Like down here, when in my loop and I'm adding names to it, I'm pushing them onto it with mpush. And when I'm popping them off, I'm using mpop. But our integer stack that we created using the Java collections class still uses push and pop. Completely different thing. Yes, hi. <laughs> All right, I will mention that though, guys. There is something interesting about Java and a lot of other languages post C++, which is that strings are considered immutable, meaning that once you're, they are created, you can't change them. And that sounds silly. Of course I could change a string. But really, you can't. If you declare a string like this, you know, name is equal to Fred, and then you try to change one of those characters like that to B, so it'll say bread rather than Fred. This language does not let you do that. Python doesn't let you do that. C++ and C do let you do that because, because they're different. This is an immutable string. If pieces inside it can't be changed, and so if you wrote a loop like this, you know, x is equal to 1, and then while x is less than a million, name equals name plus, you know, we're going to tack on a whole bunch of exclamation points after it. This creates a new string with Fred followed by an exclamation point. It doesn't add it on to the existing string. It creates a new one. Now we have two strings in memory. We had one called Fred. We have one with Fred with one exclamation point, and it keeps looping. Assume we have an X plus plus in there as well to keep it going, right? And so then it adds on another exclamation point. But no, it doesn't add it on. It creates a brand new string with two exclamation points. And now floating in memory, we have Fred. We have Fred, exclamation point. We have Fred, exclamation point, exclamation point. As it keeps running, if this is going to run 10 million times or whatever, we're going to have 10 million different versions of this data left in memory. And the garbage collector is running as fast as possible, trying to, uh, to free it all up as we go. But we could conceivably max out our stack space by doing that. And the performance of that is just horrible. There is a class that is used, just like the uh, wrapper classes give new powers to like doubles and floats and ints and stuff like that. There's something kind of a wrapper class for the string class called string builder, which is optimized so that you can actually change data inside the string. So if you were going to append something to it, it wouldn't allocate a brand new string. It would just add on a little bit more memory in order to hold the exclamation mark. And so we need to cover how to use the string builder class because if you're going to be doing a lot of string manipulation in your programming, if you have string modification inside a loop that's repeated a lot of times, then uh, just using plain old everyday strings is uh, extraordinarily bad for performance and for memory usage. Are you going to do an exam review like next class? Because the exam's actually open before next class. 
then, the, then let's do the exam review next class and then we'll push the due date of the exam opening until after that class. Okay. Dropbox.